When you hear the phrase, soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high-rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. I recently had the opportunity to host a special edition of the Soft to Steel podcast, recorded in front of a live audience at the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades Finishing Industries Forum. I was joined by six senior leaders in the finishing trades for a lively 90-minute conversation. The leaders participating were Paul Bagatellis, the CEO of Bagatellis Architectural Glass, Paul Tesoris, the president of Jupiter Contracting Company, Jessica Helmer, a partner in All Tech Decorating, Jeff Granberg, the owner and CEO of the PD Group, Bob Swanson, the retired president of Swanson and Youngdale, and Jim Williams, the general president of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. We discussed a wide range of topics relating to the people in our industry. In keeping within the framework and focus of the Soft to Steel podcast, these senior leaders answered questions relating to topics including differences, inclusion, relationships, generational values, mentoring, trust, soft skills, and love. I'm sure you will enjoy the first segment. You will find these leaders to be authentic in how they express their views. Keep in mind that their preparation was minimal. I provided them in advance with a few questions that could be used during the conversation. And perhaps, not a surprise, the questions that were spontaneous produced the most interesting conversation. Jim's going to sit with a select group of contractors from around the country and Canada, and Dennis Duran is going to moderate it. But almost everyone here knows Dennis Duran. He's been speaking at these events and for you locally for many years. He served the construction industry overall for over 30 years as a contractor, consultant, strategic trainer and facilitator, development coach, and public speaker. Dennis has launched and is hosting the Soft as Steel podcast, which we are recording here today with a panel. You'll be able to download and listen to this podcast by visiting his site and finding the link at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Please now welcome Dennis, our general president, and our contractor panel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and thanks for the invitation to bring the Soft and Steel podcast to the FIF. This is a vitally important meeting of contractors in the union. Uh, and I think that when you hear what we're talking about, you understand that thematically, uh, we're falling very much in line uh, with the future vision that the general president of the IUPAT has. Uh, I'd like to say that what we're gonna do for the next roughly 60 to 90 minutes is pivot to people. We're gonna talk about things that relate to the people in our industry at all levels. Uh, you're gonna hear the thoughts, ideas, and even the feelings of these leaders with regards to people in our industry. So let me introduce them, uh, starting from this side, whichever that side is, I'm not good at left and right, is Chris Bagatellis, who's the CEO of Bags, a glass and glazing contractor in California. Uh, sitting to his immediate left is Paul Tesoris, who was mentioned this morning in Jim's comments. No further introduction is needed for this great leader. Next to Paul is Jessica Helmer, who is the sales relationship executive and partner at All Tech Decorating. And in the middle, our general president is Jim Williams. Next to Jim is Jeff Granberg, who's the owner and CEO of PD Group, a Canadian contractor, a very large and important contractor for this union in Canada. And finally, someone you met this morning who was uh, appropriately honored. Uh, I, I'd like to say with uh, great emotion that he's a great, great friend of mine. Uh, and that is Bob Swanson, who is retired. And uh, if you want to get a, a taste of uh, more of Bob Swanson, uh, I interviewed him on my podcast, uh, one of my first interviews. A fantastic conversation. 
So let me just again just describe to you how this is going to uh, transpire this morning. Um, it is a conversation. Uh, none of these individuals were given prepared remarks to use in responding to a series of questions that I will use to kind of seed the conversation. The questions are interesting, uh, perhaps even thought-provoking, uh, perhaps even challenging to reflect on. So one ask I would have of you as the audience as you sit here and listen to this conversation, that you reflect on what your thoughts are about each of the questions as you hear what their thoughts are. Uh, I'm the guy that talks about soft skills, uh, a part of developing individuals, which I think is vitally important to the success of all industries, and certainly for the finishing trades. So I'm going to begin with my first question. And since uh, Chris is sitting closest to me, he gets to go with the first answer. All right, let's go. The question is this, how do we discover our commonality despite our differences? So I, I would say that, let me make sure I'm working here, that our, you know, our commonality, we do that through uh, our shared life experiences, right? So all of us have similar things that we go through in life, whether that's our relationships, our uh, issues with our boss, our taxes. Um, I, I think those, when we can bring those shared experiences into our conversation with our peers and our partners, we create a better environment. And, and I would contend that it's, it, there's more commonalities than we, uh, than we know. And, and things like uh, sports teams, there's another great one. I think uh, you know, we all have our home team that we root for, and we can, can create a relationship with other people through those uh, commonalities and shared life experiences, then we have a uh, better work environment and a better team. And, uh, and I would say, if I were to look out here now, a perfect example would be, um, you know, I'm from Northern California, well, California, Northern California, and I'd say, you know, go Niners. And there's a, there's, there's a, a significant group, I would imagine, that would, that would be on my team and ready to go right away, and we'd create a shared experience and, and some commonality. Not, not this week. Yeah, I did that intentionally, of course, because I know there's some Philly guys here. Paul, add on. Commonality and differences. Can you repeat the question again? I can. I, you know, I, I, should, I should mention appropriately at this point, at least a couple of people in the audience know this, that my, my number one desire in terms of a, a career journey was to be a game show host. So, so we're coming perilously close to that. Fabulous. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Jessica? Yeah, I yeah. think 150%. Yeah. You would be great at that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Could you repeat that like five times? Never mind. <laughs> Paul, the question was this. How do we discover our commonality despite our differences? I really believe from experience in, in my own life, it's a collaboration of having time together, whether it's work-related, uh, leisure time, whether it's in your neighborhood. Um, I've seen incredible differences in uh, very dissimilar background people that came to our job sites um, with a, a lot of um, derogatory beliefs going in. Um, and of course, I had to put the referee jersey on. But ironically, as, as diverse as their backgrounds were, that, that exposure time of having to work together towards a, a common goal, they began to appreciate and understand one another. And um, you know, from their inception time of working together to the time a project was done is profound. <clears throat> Um, because we, we all come with pre-existing um, mental perspectives of who someone may be based on whatever their background is, whatever their ethnic group is. Um, and I hate to say it, one of the best ways to discover one another is actually being in a work environment. Well said. You're, you're hinting at one of the things which is a barrier uh, to achieving inclusion. Uh, which is implicit bias, uh, which is, is, in, is in the dialogue more prominently now, uh, and we're starting to recognize uh, that it, it is a problem. Uh, and it's a problem that's not going to go away with soft leadership. Uh, strong leadership is required. So really good answer to the question that I had to repeat twice to get the answer. <laughs> you know. 
Yeah. I'm going to get tougher as it goes on here, right? We only have a certain amount of time. All right. Uh, Jessica, do I need to repeat, repeat the question for you? I'm going to need you to do it one more time. No, kidding. <laughs> so I think by caring genuinely, right? Remi remembering that each and every one of us are human. We all have our quirks. We all have our differences. And just remembering that just because there are differences amongst each other, it doesn't automatically need to be a problem. And I think when you care genuinely for people and look at them as humans, you gain trust. And when people trust you, they're going to eventually and naturally be comfortable and want to open up. Well said. Jim. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's just great to hear our employers even talking about the same issues that we do at labor, um, which is to care for our membership and to, and to care for one another. And often we don't spend enough time on the things that, that genuinely unite us. Um, I remember there was a time went and met a, a very large glazing contractor who said, you know, I don't sit with my labor partners as much as I sit with the guy who sells me caulk, right? Um, and you guys make up almost 70% of, of, of my business, right? That is what unites us. Simple fact that our membership are, are your employees and we don't spend enough time in, in between um, contract season, everyone's busy um, and, and, and we get that. But forums like this and settings like this, these are the ways to unite us, not divide us. Well said, Jeff. So I can answer that question a few different ways, but just to bolt on one of the things that Jim said is, <coughs> excuse me, in his speech today, just show that you could hear the passion about the contractors working closer with the union. And that's something that I think is, needs to be continued on and not just at negotiation time to build what you said, is we need to get to know all our, all our business managers and our, all our district council and appealing to them to build relationships. Because if you need an enemy, it's not each other. It's the non-union sector. Until we get that right and start pushing back, because we've never been in a time, as far as I'm concerned, where there's such a shortage of workers. How do we get that workers? And we can talk about diversity, inclusion, all those things as well. But I mean, we have to work together to come up with a, a, a game plan, get in the war room and come up, how do we make this work as partners, not separating ourselves. The second part of that one I take a look at is, I talked to a group of people, this was about two years ago, and it was mostly people, you know, my age group, and they were complaining, just like our fathers did about, we just didn't work as hard as them, and went and on and on, and they were talking about, obviously, the millennials. You know, and I spoke up and I said, fortunately, I have two kids that are of that age group and they challenge me all the time. If you allow yourself to be challenged, you get to grow. And I think, unfortunately, there's sometimes people from my generation are retired in place and they want to keep doing things the same way all the time. But if you look at the facts, the millennials actually started in computers at a young age. And I'm not just talking about traditional education, but they're smarter and they're better educated. And if you can tap in what makes them tick, and a lot of times that work-life balance, we hate hearing that at our age, but it's true. And they can work more productive, but I think we need to make sure we do a better job of mentoring, not just pushing orders down. Yeah, yeah, well said. I think the, I, one element of, of what you've just talked about is, is one of those differences, and that is generational differences. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you addressed it beautifully. My good friend, Mr. Swanson. Uh, discovering our commonality, a, a few things come to mind. One would be, in, especially in work relationships, uh, shed the barriers, and a big barrier is, oh, here comes Bob, he's president of the company, we're in trouble. <laughs> All I am is Bob Swanson, yeah, trying to right. do the same thing every worker on that job site is trying to do, be a win for Swanson Youngdale and a win for our customer. Yeah. So I, I think the first thing that starts commonality is shed what could be a barrier. Uh, the second thing that comes to mind is no judgment. Uh, again, it's easy to right away say, you know, I'm better than you, you better listen to me. That gets us nowhere in understanding our commonalities. Uh, last, I would say, uh, be vulnerable. Uh, that opens up the conversation. And it takes usually a first step by whoever I'm dealing with. So that whole issue of mental health, et cetera. It's amazing when I'm vulnerable and explain and open up to my journey, uh, it, it opens up the doors to all sorts of things. So uh, I would say those are three things that come to mind. Could you share with us, uh, it came out of our conversation in the podcast, you talked about your viewpoint on, on certain aspects of the workplace. 
20, 30, 40 years ago, comparing it to more recent times before you retire. Could you share some of your thoughts about how you look to things, particularly as it relates to what I affectionately refer to, and that is the soft skills part, the people part, then and now? Well, in the 60s and 70s, there, there were no soft skills. It was uh, basically a lot of yelling and get the job done or you're fired. Uh, intimidation was uh, all, present all the time. Fear present all the time. So people weren't oftentimes performing uh, because they wanted to. They were fearful they were going to lose their job. So over, so over time, it was became, this is a team. And I can't be abusing part of my team partners. I have to work with them. And in a labor relationship, uh, it, I was involved in labor relations. Be nice, Bob. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it so often was us and them, but not only us and them, they're the enemy at both parties. Yeah. And thank, thankfully, over the last 10, 15 years, we're getting by that. We still have kernels of that around. But it, 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 we're in the same industry, and we have the same goal. And here's the thing. It's, it isn't zero sum. It's win-win. So, you know, if uh, we're doing well as an industry, getting more work hours, guess what? As a contractor, I'm more successful, and my employees are more successful, and your members are more successful. But here's the key that we forgot. Recruitment. If our industry looks like it's dying, who is going to join us? Nobody. So we have a recruitment issue. And we have to start realizing if, if we show a better face about this whole thing, we're going to be more attractive to that young generation that we are a good alternative for them. Did I get where you wanted to go, Dennis? Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Jessica, give us the millennials' perspective. On I, I don't know if I can do that right now. That was a fantastic answer. And, yes, you, know, you can. A millennial's perspective on all of this. So obviously I was not around back in the day when, and I mean that in the nicest way possible, um, when it was yelling and intimidation, so I can't speak on that, but I can speak on how beneficial it is to be able to have mentors in the workplace and be able to feel comfortable, hey, raise your hand, I don't get it, can you explain it a different way? Um, and to have that respected and to have your voice and your opinions heard. That's, that's very important. What motivates millennials? Pardon? What motivates millennials? What motivates? I think a work-life balance does, but I also think a lot of that is trust, right? You, it's earned. You, you need to prove that you can be trusted by your employer in order to have a flex schedule, right? I, I think that's something that's earned, not necessarily just given. Does that make sense? It does. All right. It does. Let me toss out another question. What role does fear play in our business? Chris? I, I, speaking of what Bob was saying, I, I recall in my younger days, I was always around construction sites, and I, I felt in, you know, in the, this, that's 70s, 80s. Fear was a big part of the construction environment. It was typically a superintendent who was yelling, screaming, and in your face, and that's, that's how the game was done. So I, I think we've developed over the years where it's, as it's become, honestly, more sophisticated, we see a lot less of that yelling and screaming, and it's more about you know, documentation and skills and and you know, recognizing recogn recognition of those skills and those schedules get better and teams perform at a higher level. So, you know, there's definitely fear is you know is a factor that's out there, but nothing the way it, the way it was 50 years ago. It's just a it's a different game that I think we play now. So yeah. still there. Fear. I mean, from a contractor's perspective, you know, we we're terrified not to make a schedule because contractually we get, our, we get it handed to us if we miss schedules. So that's, a, you know, that's a, certainly a driving factor. It drives me, but it's not the same physical uh, threat that it maybe it was in the day. Mm -hmm. Paul? You know, um, with responsibility to complete a task or a function, fear will always be present. I was fearful of coming up here today. So I, I think, I think it's, it's a, a function and 
intertwined with, with really what we have to do in life responsibly, either as a family member or working with a team. <clears throat> I think um, where we diverge from that is like what Chris just said and Bob had mentioned early. We don't necessarily need to use fear and intimidation as a tool. It, it, it's not received well anymore. I think in our upbringings, in our exposure to work from the time of our work inception, we just felt that it was hand in hand with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, I think we're always going to live with a, a degree of fear, a fear of failure. Um, but again, um, we don't necessarily need that from our uh, supervisors and business owners. Um, I think there's enough of it, there's enough stress in the world um, that everyone has to come to in this room. Um, you know, it's, it's dynamic times right now. So I think we're all walking around with a higher baseline stress level. So um, that is a tool using fear and management tactic is, I, I have found it to be counterproductive. Good. Jim? Yeah, it, you know, talk about fear on the job site, but as a labor leader, our membership, and Paul, you touched on it, you know, the fear that our members have and, you know, being a labor leader is trying to convey the fear. It's surviving in this economy. It's, it's you know, the rapid pace of information and news um, with their phones, with, you know, just everyday living, that our members carry that to work. And, it, and it's great to hear our contractors talk mm -hmm. about being more inclusive because, in general, we're all living in fear. We're living in fear, living paycheck to paycheck. And in our industry, you know, uh, sadly, we haven't kept up with, with, you know, rising inflation, you know, the cost of labor just continues to go up and, and have we kept up? And a lot of times, you know, the fear that our members have on being able to even make 2,000 hours a year in this industry, it drives their fear to work. And they can't go to work in an environment that's also fearful. And I think that's why we see the rise in, um, you know, mental health issues and substance abuse issues. Um, I think because our industry was so male dominated and it had such a, you know, you're the breadwinner and you have to make that living to feed, you know, to provide for your family. Well, nowadays, everybody's wife works too or, or husband and, that, and we have two job families that, you know, you don't even have enough time to spend with your kids and you're spending more time in the workplace than you are with your family. And when you're struggling in this economy, then the fear and the anxiety just continues to rise. Yeah. Jeff. Well, I think everybody's saying the same thing is fear doesn't have a place in the workplace anymore. It just doesn't. I mean, the rules of the game has changed. Uh, you're not fearful for your job because you can walk across the street and get another one. We've, we've talked before we come up on stage is it's a common problem is the shortage of workers. So you have to kind of reinvent yourself as an organization and how do you attract people? If you don't attract people by fear. And I guess the other thing I look at is, it, you know, fear. If you have fear of taking risks, you're not going to be successful. I mean, I say to my kids, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. And I say the same thing as in the workplace. Now, if you make the same damn mistake three times, you're not learning either, and we should probably look at you getting a different employment. But short of that, though, it's like you have to be confident in yourself. And I, you talk about the mental health issues. I think that's, that's so prevalent in our society. And I think we're moving away from that macho image where, you know, it's not cool to talk about your feelings and, you know, that's so important to understand the people that, that work for you so you can find how do they learn, you know, what are their triggers. I think that's extremely important to understand the triggers. Yeah. Some of you have heard me talk about this notion of developing the whole person, uh, that, that unions in general, the construction trades certainly have done a, a good to a very good job of developing the basic hard skills. The apprenticeship programs continue to improve and have a more and more benefit for the signatory contractors, but we're not doing enough of is developing the whole person. Um, and so the question is this, how important is it for us as contractors and labor leaders to recognize that how we develop people needs to change? Uh, and it hasn't changed enough yet. Paul, you, you had some thoughts on that even before today's session. 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're different, we're dealing with different wiring in people. Um, I'm, I'm just speaking general, generalizationally um, of myself. Um, the, the, the wiring on the circuit has changed tremendously. Um, and I think, Dennis, you touched this on this in a, a number of your writings, is that, you know, things such as emotional intelligence, um, which I think we were um, naive and ignorant about how important a skill that is, whether it be for uh, a, a working team member, a for, even at a foreman's level. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably a skill set that should have been emphasized and reinforced back in the days when, when I was working the tools. Um, having an understanding of, of those types of skills now, I think, um, is very relevant. And, and I think, you know, just with progression in, in our culture and in our society, a, a number of the soft skills that you point to are going to make entities more productive and profitable. And I, I think it's more, it's either you get on the bus or get left behind at this point. You know, that, that's the trends, that's trends, and those are the areas of um, propelling people to do, to do better in their, in their personal lives as well as um, more successful in their careers. Yeah, well said. Jessica, your thoughts? So I think, again, if you can build a, a company and a, a training platform that is going to have an open-ended conversation and acknowledging people's differences and qualities and how they learn differently is definitely gonna help that, right? So I may learn one way, he may learn another way, but if I have somebody that can adapt and train in the ways that are gonna benefit me, the whole entire company and the whole entire organization is going to thrive. And that's going to create that trust and it's going to allow people to be open and grow personally. Yeah, Jim, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my thoughts, like, you know, we have to have more empathy. Um, and as a union leader, and, and um, you know, I say it all the time, our business agents, um, they, they got to represent the membership from day one to, till they retire. And, and, and when you do that, you, you have to have empathy um, because people do struggle. Um, what you were as a 25-year-old is not what you are when you're a 45-year-old or, or getting ready to, re to retire. And we have to teach and create a culture of empathy within the, within the union so that our business agents have the proper skills to, to help people through personal crisis, um, you know, struggles at work, struggles at home. Um, you know, that's what a union is supposed to be, which is the entity that supports and represents our membership from day one to the day they retire. Um, and, and so within that, you're gonna have all the different ups and downs of somebody's work life that you have to deal with. And you have to show care, um, and you have to show empathy. If you were to, if I were to ask you, as I'm about to ask you the question, if you could, you could pick one teachable skill outside of hard skills, one teachable skill to teach an apprentice, a journey person, even foreman and up, what would that skill be? Jim, you wanna go first? I mean, I hate to repeat myself and say empathy, but, but that is a learned skill, and you, and you have to have the ability to really connect to other people, and a union is all about people. I mean, you know, I, I tell my staff this all the time. We don't make money, we don't build things, right? We are a people organization, and within that, we have to teach our people to be more open-minded, to be more caring, and, and to look out for one another, or else what are we doing? What are we really doing? Yeah. Jeff? Well, to me, it comes down to lead rather than manage. Uh, I think the biggest thing that's changed is that, you know, I, I truly believe that the generation that we're dealing with is that wants to learn, they want a voice. 
And so just because we, we did a tank lying this way, for an example, maybe a guy came from a different company, he's got a more innovative way of doing it. But if we close the door and say, no, this is how we've always done it, that's one of my pet peeves. And one of our guys says, well, why do you do it that way? Well, we've always done it that way. Well, that, there's a saying it used to be when we grew up, if, if the bicycle wasn't broken, don't fix it. Don't fix it. <laughs> now if it's not broken, break it and rebuild it. And so to me, it's that communication piece of the guys understanding their crew, what motivates them, how do they learn, what you touched on, because we all learn differently. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really tap into that. So I think it comes down to that, the emotional intelligence is just understanding the people you work with and being okay that they challenge you. Mm -hmm. And I think again, that that's something that we have a hard time with sometimes is that I don't need to be right. I don't run my business as, as a democracy, but I certainly encourage people to speak up and say, I don't think we should do it this way. My, my question after that is that, okay, what's your potential solutions? Let's talk about that. Don't just come in and say, hey, the, the, this doesn't work yeah. unless you got a solution. Yeah. Bob. Uh, first off, your question about apprentice, I would say listening. Uh, too often, and then myself included, it's easy. You think you're listening, but you, all you can, you, you're just already thinking about how am I going to respond? And then part of listening is confirming, this is what I heard, is that correct? And getting that dialogue going back and forth. And it, it gets you faster to that equal plane versus if I'm ready to jump, uh, already I'm here and you're here. I'm not listening. I'm hearing, but not listening. Yeah. Uh, as far as how we can keep going with this, working more, better together, I think we have to understand we're all whole people. So. Bob Swanson's Bob Swanson. Jim Williams is Jim Williams. We just happen to have roles we play and titles we have. So again, let's get rid of that baggage. We're whole, and here's the other piece. We tend as employers, and I would think labor leaders, we just see each other, who we see at work. But that person goes home to another world. And I think part of this whole thing is being uh, vulnerable to bring your also your home life to work so we can understand where you're coming from. And back to Jim's point, as we navigate through life, different things motivate us. So it's easy to say, uh, well, geez, this person always gets motivated by a, a bonus or pay increase or always a title or whatever. That may work at this point in their life, but not 10 years from now or five years from now. So, and generalizing, well, all our project managers, they like, we give a guy a car and this, this well, maybe a different project manager, totally different, that doesn't mean anything. So the old story, whatever rewards one person may not reward somebody else. So I threw a lot at you, but those are thoughts that came to mind. Yeah. Chris, you're, you're chomping at the bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we heard a lot, of, a lot of good things. You put them all together, and it came back to what we were talking about, commonality, finding those, sharing those, you know, those family events with your peers, you know, listening. That's fantastic because that allows people to learn. When you listen, you learn. And as, as the world changes, and in particular with technology, it's about continuous improvement. And if you're not listening, you're not going to improve. And you need to engage with your team and with the people you work with to new processes, hear what they have to say, and then evaluate and make good decisions. And that's what allows things to move forward and will allow us, you know, as union contractors to be more competitive and to ward off, you know, the competition. Yeah. Paul? Just to touch on a subset of the emotional intelligence and its importance, uh, I would say two components of that. I think really we all need uh, to improve upon, particularly possibly um, the younger fellows is self-discipline and structure in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know, self-discipline is something we all struggle with. And I, I think that's a component that in uh, increasing um, your ability to have that is gonna just make your life better. It's gonna be more rewarding. Um, and structure, uh, just to go back to again, you know, we're all walking around, you know, multitasking far more than even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of um, new workforce as well as ourselves, like we all struggle, we all read productivity books, like how do we handle 
the deluge of emails and text messages and everything. I think, um, I think assisting in, in that is going to probably lower um, stress levels. So we're not all as edgy in the workplace or at home, which should help diminish maybe some of the mental issues that you know people are confronted with. Yeah. There are two more installments following immediately behind this initial installment. It'll be dropped on your favorite podcast platform on Tuesday. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast so that you are notified when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Soft as Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast with Dennis Duran.